As we practice, we're exploring possibilities, trying to expand our range of possibilities. When you look at the Buddha's quest for awakening, you see that he followed or tried out many paths. But there's some paths he didn't try, because he saw that those would actually be paths that would close down possibilities. One would be the path of saying that everything you did was preordained, you had no choices. So you simply had to accept what came. That's not a path you can experiment with, and it's not a path you can explore. And it closes off lots of possibilities. So he didn't take that path. Another assumption that he didn't try was that we can't observe ourselves. We have to depend on somebody else to do all the observing for us. The whole principle of how he practiced was to look at his actions, and if they weren't getting the results he wanted, to look at them carefully to see what might be changed. Which assumes, of course, that we can observe our own actions. This is why later on he said that the mind is luminous. That statement is sometimes interpreted to mean that the mind is innately pure, innately awakened. But in the context, it doesn't mean that. He says it's because, it's because the mind is luminous that we can develop it. In other words, it can watch itself. A thought comes through the mind, and you can watch the thought. It gives results. You can watch the results. You can see the connections. So those are some of the assumptions we make as we decide that we're going to explore. We want to be able to expand them. And this is what the Four Noble Truths are all about, is they expand our sense of what's possible. That Third Noble Truth, saying that total end of suffering is possible. You look at some of the other teachings that were being taught at the Buddhist time, and they'd say, suffering will end, but there's nothing you can do about it. You can't speed up the process. Very fatalistic teaching. Others say, you, you do have choices, but your choices can't get you to any place that's totally unconditioned, because after all, the actions are conditions. So in the Third Noble Truth, the Buddha was saying something radical. There is an unconditioned happiness, and there is something that you can do to get there. That required a new view of causality, which is one of the reasons why the Buddha took principles of causality so seriously. His was a principle of causality that allowed for developing skills. In other words, there are some things that come in from the past, results of past actions, that come into the present moment. And then there are choices you make in the present moment that don't have to be shaped by those past actions. So there is a pattern that you can learn, but at the same time you do have freedom of choice. When the Buddha expressed his awakening in the shortest terms, it was that principle of causality. And the few times when he went out to, you might say, pick fights with other teachers to criticize them, search them out to criticize them, it was all over the issues of causality. Because a principle that allows for skillfulness is an important principle to hold to. You can develop skills. And you will develop as a person. And the more skills you have, if they really are skillful, then the more options you have for yourself. So right now we're working on concentration. We're working on expanding our options, expanding our possibilities. It 
keeping in mind the connection between the practice of concentration, the rest of the path, and the relationship between the path to the end of suffering. And part of the experience of being on the path, on, on the one hand, is to create concentration as an alternative to other forms of pleasure. A lot of insight is lies in seeing that certain things are worth doing and certain things are not worth doing. And your idea of what's worth doing is going to depend on your range of skills. Think about little children before they can speak. They just make nonsense syllables, and for them that's worth doing. But when they finally get the hang of language, then there's not much use for nonsense syllables anymore. Think of the games you played as a child that were a good exercise for the body. And as the body grew and developed more, more abilities, all of a sudden those very childish games were no longer worth doing. Your range has expanded. You have a better idea of what's worth doing, what's but what's not. And so the pleasure that comes from concentration is one of those things that allows us to see that it is possible to find happiness that doesn't have to depend on sensuality. There is this option. And when you take this option seriously and actually develop it, that's when you can look back on your old sensual pleasures and get a much better perspective on them. A lot of the things that you used to pursue don't seem worth pursuing anymore. The friends you had that used to pursue those things with you, you begin to wonder, what was that friendship all about? And for quite a while, the, the practice of concentration will seem very satisfactory. I remember when I was first teaching the Four Noble Truths here in California, we had a weekend devoted to the topic. We got to the Third Noble Truth first, and then the Fourth Noble Truth, and people were saying that the Third Noble Truth didn't seem all that attractive, but the Fourth Noble Truth, especially right concentration, that was very attractive. And so you develop what's attractive until you begin to see its limitations. This is why knowledge of the Third Noble Truth is so useful, so important. To remind you that no matter how good the concentration gets, there is something that is better. And when you're ready to see the drawbacks of concentration, ready to admit the limitations, you don't have to be stuck. There is an opening to something better there. So work on your concentration. Expand your range. This will expand your sense of what is possible and also expand your range of yourself. Because with every skill that you develop, you create a new self to go along with the skill. In fact, I've read a couple of pieces, some even written by monks, saying if you actually work on concentration, it's going to require a sense of self. After all, you have to make an effort and you have to think about how you're going to benefit from this in the future. Then you have to have a sense of you as a person capable of doing this, all of which creates a lot of yous, lots of selves. We all know that the teaching is about getting rid of our sense of self, so don't try to create any concentration. Just learn how to be satisfied with what you got. There won't be any self around that, this person said. But that's just keeping your range of options very narrow. And within that very narrow range, you're going to be deciding what's worth doing, what's not worth doing. and it, your choices are going to be pretty limited. And the old lazy selves that take over. So yes, we are creating new, new selves as we practice concentration. But they're selves to be added to the committee and they change the balance of power. Tip it in the right direction. And then as the skill gets more and more mastered, those senses of self can fade into the background. 
that you get focused on the skill in and of itself. And get more sensitive to what the mind is doing to create this state of concentration. You begin to see it really is fabricated, it really is put together. And there will come a point where you're ready to see the drawbacks of that process, the fact that it is fabricated. And the mind will develop naturally at that point. You push it. In other words, you're not just letting it grow every old which way. It's like a tree. You take a tree and you make a bonsai out of it. It looks pretty unnatural, but it's the tree's natural reaction to a certain kind of training. In the same way, getting the mind into concentration, it's the mind's natural reaction to the training. And when you begin to see the limitations of the concentration itself and realize you don't want to go back to your old pre-concentration pre days, you start looking around, what other options are there? When you see the option of something unfabricated, you will naturally want to go there. Now that option wouldn't have opened up without a lot of training. But it's the mind's natural reaction to the training. That's why there's such a, an intimate relationship between the Third and the Fourth Noble Truth. So that Third Truth is there to remind you of this possibility. Some people say, why is it that the Buddha put the Third Noble Truth, the end of suffering, prior to the path to the end? It's like a doctor's diagnosis. The doctor describes the symptoms, tells you where the symptoms come from, and then tells you it, whether it is possible or not to cure the b disease by treating the cause. And once it, the doctor has established that possibility, then there's the path, the treatment. Even though as we're meditating, we're not focusing on nirvana. You're practicing jhana, you're not even focusing on jhana. You're focusing on your breath. But you're focusing on the breath not for its own sake. It's for the sake of the concentration, and you're developing the concentration for the sake of something unfabricated. Always keep that in the back of your mind. Keep that perspective in the back of the mind, that range of possibilities. Don't close off possibilities for yourself. Always try to keep your options open. <laughs>